Hi, and welcome to the Solar IMG podcast. Today we're going to be discussing Fukushima, San Onofre, and much more with today's guest, who should be familiar to some of our listeners. He's Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. But first, if you'd like to suggest a podcast topic or sponsor a podcast, please suggest it on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash solar IMG, or hit the donate button on solarimg.org. Every donation goes a long way. But now we're going to go over to Arnie. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, I'm glad I could come back. Recently, there's been a, a big story that uh, there's been a suspension of operating licenses and new reactors in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit what's up with that? Yeah, yeah what's happened is the, um, the NRC made something called the Waste Confidence Rule, and they kind of arbitrarily decided that uh, it was perfectly acceptable to store nuclear waste above ground for as long as 100 years. Um, a group took them to court, and the court decided that they really hadn't proved their case and that uh, there wasn't enough evidence to support the waste confidence rule. So the NRC just had to um, uh, had to punt and say, well, we've got to go over and redo the rule. Uh, in the meantime, until the rule is um, redone, um, they will um, not issue any new license extensions or not issue any new operating permits. Now, now that sounds pretty severe, but what they can do is they can waive their own uh, requirements individually and allow these plants to continue to operate. So they can say, well, we're, we're confident. Eventually, we'll have confidence. So in the meantime, we'll, we'll just continue your old license, but we won't, um, we won't give you, um, we won't give you the new one, but you can operate anyway. So, they, uh, the old chairman, Chairman Yasko, who certainly wasn't uh, um, beloved by the industry, basically said that he thought within three or four years they'd have this thing straightened out and uh, they'd be back on track. So I think the industry is looking at it as a speed bump, that they, um, they think it may uh, slow down a couple of reactors, but um, we're not going to be shutting reactors down in the meantime if the NRC has anything to do with it. And in San Onofre, they apparently removed some structural supports to add some tubes or some other things. How, how did that ever get authorized? Boy, that's a great question. The, at San Onofre, the um, old steam generator was uh, was was built in the in 1980s, and um, it had uh, served its useful life, and they wanted to replace it. So they went to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and they said, we're going to replace it in kind with one that's just like it. Um, and uh, what happened was it was nowhere near like the one they replaced it with. They put it in in 2010 and the second one in 2011, turned them on, and within 18 months, the tubes had rattled to the point where they, uh, they pretty much destroyed the steam generators. So their units have been shut down now since um, uh, since January and likely will remain shut down for a long time to come because they, um, they, they tried to um, come up with a modern design that had never been tried before, built by a vendor who had never built one of these before. And the, the net effect is uh, they've got a, a plant now that this is the single biggest accident near miss, the single biggest near miss in the nuclear industry since the davis Bessey reactor back in 2002. What happened there was a, a rust hole in the nuclear reactor almost broke through and would have caused a loss of coolant accident. Well, this one is the next worst to davis Bessey. Um, they had eight tubes that were on the edge of failing, and, and had there been a steam line break, uh, they would have had an enormous release of radiation, much greater than they ever anticipated in their um, final safety analysis report. They would have had to um, evacuate a large portion of Southern California, and they would have had a meltdown. Uh, so we came close to a nuclear meltdown here at, uh, at San Onofre um, because these tubes were on the edge of, uh, of failing. Recently, RADNET and some of the other radiation detection networks have detected some, some big spikes in uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, what could have caused that? I don't have um, uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in, uh, in in the data 
that's uh, that's taken by these RadNet um, sites. There's so much variability, and there's so many people that, that, uh, that with good intention may not have the right equipment, or um, they, you know there, there 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 could be many other scientific issues involved. So I I really don't know what's going on out in Pennsylvania. Uh, okay, in in Canada there was. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the soaks meters and how do they exactly work? Because I spoke with a physicist who said that um, four comma two zero microsieverts is a negligible amount, but the the soaks detector says it's a dangerous radiation background. So how do we make sense of all that? Yeah, making sense out of radiation data is is a is a, is a tough job, and the um, uh, you really need to get this into a, a laboratory where the instrumentation is better than handheld. You know, for you and I to have a handheld device, it's a really good thing because it can give an early warning and know whether or not we're in jeopardy. But unless you've got a really good scientific device, you know, like like uh, we're using at Worcester Poly and, and, and other uh, institutions around the country. Um, raw data taken by civilians, um, uh, really, uh, unless we can verify it in a, in a serious lab, yeah, I, I can't jump to conclusions about how, uh, how severe or how not severe the, uh, the information is. We're going to be putting up in the next week or so um, a video, a 15-minute video, that talks about just the level of detail that a scientist really needs to uh, uh, to do to um, uh, to do a to be confident in in the number. So when I see these numbers, I um, um, I, I, I it gets my attention, it gets my concern, but I don't um, I don't feel necessarily that it's a good idea to broadcast it um, until I can verify it in the lab. Now, and I remember you had mentioned that you were accepting samples for laboratory testing. How, how did that work out? We've been getting lab samples from uh, around the country, around the world, but, you know, especially the West Coast and more so, more importantly, in Japan now since, uh, since the Fairwind site went up over a year ago. And um, the the, uh, uh, the data has been compiled. There's a bunch of scientific papers in the works. Um, you know, the the one that's uh, most prominent right now is the one that Marco Kaltofen did at um, the American Public Health Association, and that was back in October of last year, so ten months ago. And and we saw that um, uh, you know air filters on cars, for instance, and kids' shoes. We're just loaded with cesium. So that number's been out there now for a year. But now we're seeing, working with um, uh, people in Europe, a a, a different group, um, we're focusing on dust, house dust. And we're asking people in Japan to send us their vacuum cleaner bags. And what we're finding, um, some of the bags are squeaky clean, which is great. And, And we tell the people that, and they can breathe a sigh of relief. But some of the bags are quite highly contaminated. We've got one bag from uh, out of about 80 miles away from the reactor that's got 100,000 um, 100, becquerels uh, per kilogram. So that means that a, a two-pound bag is, um, is giving 100,000 disintegrations every second. So that tells me that, uh, you know, the Japanese are not doing a very good job of informing the public about the ongoing public health issues for internal radiation. You know, they walk around with their handheld detectors, and if they're reading close to normal, everybody's happy. But the internal contamination in Japan is, is, um, uh, I believe, significant and totally ignored by the Japanese government. Um, They could do a much better public health effort if they if they talk to people about vacuuming with high efficiency particulate filters, wet dusting, and things like that, because um, you know the, the the Japanese sleep on the floor. You know they roll mats out at night, and they're down with the dust, which we know to be contaminated. It was also really revealed that some of the contractors were, were removing some of their badges in order to maintain their um, profitability of their corporations. So this is this is probably a systemic thing, not a, you know, not just 
from the government, but with the companies that they're working with? Uh, moving badges um, or, or removing badges or covering bag- badges with uh, some sort of a protective uh, layer uh, is, is done all over the world. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, you'll see in cases, uh, um, even in the United States, where, for instance, a welder uh, wants to complete a weld. So he'll keep his, his badge, but he won't keep it on his arm near the work. He may put it on his foot, which is uh, away from the work. And the, the net effect is that the uh, the badge underestimates the uh, the amount of exposure. Um, and there's been documented cases of... Uh, of leaving deliberately leaving badges behind uh, throughout the in, the industry, not just in Japan. So I was not surprised that um, that that some Japanese contractors got caught doing it. You know they're lowering their exposure so they can make more money. You know when they go off um, go over the limit, they they can't work anymore. So by keeping that badge uh, protected, they can work longer and um, and make more money. And, Unfortunately, Tokyo Electric is a worker shortage, and uh, so therefore, they're really not uh, policing this very well either. And what's the status right now of the the removal of the rods? How did that go, and what's up with the fuel pools? Well, on Unit 4, they pulled two two rods from a reactor uh, from the spent fuel pool that were never in the nuclear reactor, so they were fresh nuclear fuel. Um, And they just wanted to see if they could do it, and and they um, also began to sample the materials in the rods to to look for uh, salt or to look for boron and things like that, just to get an idea of the chemicals that might be attached to the material. The the actual nuclear fuel that's hot, um, physically hot and radioactively hot, is still under as much water as they can possibly keep it under and will likely be that way for at least another 18 months to come. Now, Ferens is going to have a, uh, a new video up on the whole issue of um, the, the spent fuel pool at Unit 4, um, and that should be coming up uh, you know, sometime between now and, and August 15th. We'll have that video up. It explains it in detail, but it is... Um, a very threatening situation. You know, we've um, nuclear fuel can burn in air, and nuclear fuel um, in that pool has more cesium than was ever released in all the bombs that were um, uh, dropped in uh, above ground testing um, for 40 years. And um, so, if the fuel were to um, burn, and that would be caused by uh, an earthquake that cracks the pool, for instance. If that were to happen, Japan would be cut in half, and and likely contamination would would circle the northern hemisphere, conceivably being really significant. You know, you um, of course we're out here where no science has gone before. No one's ever really even thought of, oh my God, can a fuel pool catch fire? Um, so uh, we we take a really hard look at that. We've got some. Never before seen video of uh, uh, that, that, that that amplifies it, and my conclusion is it's um, it's really serious, and we need to get the fuel out of that pool just as quickly as possible um, because you know the next earthquake isn't going to wait until we're done. We've got to get it out before the next earthquake comes. And how do you evacuate Tokyo or Southern California? Well, I'm, I'm not <laughs> suggesting we're going to need to evacuate. Southern I'm just California, saying hypothetically. But... Hypothetically, how would you? It's it's impossible, I believe. I mean, you can't evacuate Tokyo or Southern California. It, it's impossible. So I think we need to really, really uh, keep monitoring this situation. Um, a, a question from some of our, uh, our 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 team members: Has there ever been a follow up study on the downwinders of Three Mile Island, like 20 years later? The best. Uh, follow-up study is by uh, uh, Dr. Steve Wing, and uh, uh, Wing gives a lecture on the Fairwinds website. Uh, so if you, you know, it's pretty searchable. If you look up uh, Steve Wing, um, comma Three Mile Island, or something like that, on the on our website, he's got a, a thirty-minute explanation of 
what happened to the downwinders at uh, at Three Mile Island. The problem is that there were no downwinders because there were no wind. So there, it was a very calm day when the accident happened, and the radiation settled into the river valley. And when you uh, take a look at the data that, that Steve Wing has, it's crystal clear that the cancer rates in the River Valley are um, are higher than the, the cancer rates on the hilltops that are a couple miles away. So it, it, his his analysis is peer reviewed, and it's uh, it's solid as a rock. And and so we can we know based on Wing's data that. Um, uh, Perhaps a, a several thousand people got lung cancer. That's what he looked at. Uh, additions to the lung cancer population, because that data was available. All the other data is lacking. The industry convinced Judge Rambo um, to do a, uh, a really poor analysis, and um, uh, as a result, all of the uh, data that uh, that came out of that accident. Um, is essentially useless, and deliberately so, because the NRC and the nuclear industry definitely wanted to downplay the significance. So Wing did the best job possible with the information available, and he shows that there uh, there really were um, uh, you know, significant increases in cancer after the accident. Um, can the release of radioactive isotopes affect the ionization of the upper levels of the atmosphere? You know, I found a scientific paper that says it can. Um, and uh, I, I don't know personally, but there is a paper out there that's about 30 years old that talks about um, you know, releases of radioactive material into the upper atmosphere affecting um, the ions that are up there. Um, someone thought to study it 30 years ago, and there's, as far as I know, just one paper that supports that. But there's no papers that refute it. And recently, TEPCO has released a bunch of their recordings of a video conference, uh, Sound Audio. Um, what's your opinion on these video conference releases? I watched them, and I was appalled. You, you know, the Japanese are supposed to be the best people on the planet for emergency organization. You know, as a culture, they're organized. And as a, as a culture, they know that earthquakes occur. So they should have ingrained in them um, the best you'd expect people to behave in the event of, um, uh, you know, of an accident. And, and frankly, I saw the worst. The, the, the people at the Tokyo Electric Home Office um, had no clue what the plant people were uh, were experiencing. And frankly, I think the plant people were uh, were at their best when they were on their own. Uh, um, the, the, there are heroes here, and, and there's a thousand thousand men at, at Fukushima Daiichi, and there's another thousand people at Fukushima Daini. Um, who risked their lives and, and um, did extraordinary things with very minimal supplies to um, uh, to, uh, to to wrestle this bowl to the to the ground, but they didn't get any help from Tokyo Electric offsite people, and they didn't get any help from the government. They did it despite Tokyo Electric and despite the government. And uh, you know, as a, as a former operator, I have the deepest respect. For those couple of uh, couple of thousand people who uh, who stayed behind and and saved the and saved the country, and they've had many successes. I mean, the, the demolitions, and they've been working really hard. They've been doing pretty good considering the hand they've been dealt and the lack of you know, support. There, <laughs> there could have been fourteen meltdowns and not three. Uh, if you look at the data. Um, there were um, there's six units at Fukushima Daiichi. There's four units at Fukushima Daini. There's another three down at Anagawa, and there's uh, another at Tokai. Um, the, the net effect there is that um, there were 20, there's 37 diesel generators between those plants. 24 of those diesels were knocked out by the tsunami. So. We, as a as an engineering culture, um, you need the, the the diesels to cool the plant. And of course, we all know that Fukushima Daiichi, the diesels were flooded. 
But at the other plants, the diesels weren't flooded. They were knocked out because the tsunami knocked out the cooling water to the diesel, something we call service water. And um, so Japan narrowly missed 14 meltdowns and not three because the cooling water to um, 24 of the 37 diesels was um, was destroyed. And, and again, brave men at uh, Onagawa and Tokai um, essentially stepped into the breach too, and um, and and prevented uh, prevented this accident from becoming more severe too. The, the plant manager at Fukushima Daini, which is the not Daiichi, which is the one that had the accident, but but Daini, which is six miles away, he's quoted as saying that if the tidal wave happened on a uh, on a Saturday, his four units would have melted down too. He had a thousand people on site because it was a Friday. If it happened on a weekend, there would have been a skeleton crew there. The roads would have been destroyed, so nobody could have got in to help. And we would have had uh, Fukushima Daiichi and Fukushima Daini in meltdown condition. So uh, we came very close to uh, what happened was unimaginable. So this is almost unimaginably unimaginable. Uh, how close we came to losing 14 nuclear reactors. Insane. Well, <laughs> you'll have to excuse me. I, I just, I, as always, when I speak with you, I, I, my mind gets racing and I, I lose my train of thought. Um, we were speaking about the cultural um, aspects of Japanese society. What do you think about all of the popular protests and the and the, and the videos that were coming out from the uh, the politicians and the mayors of towns and all that? What we're seeing is a dramatic change in the Japanese culture as a result of the accident. And it's being spearheaded by women. The, um, there's a lot of men who say, well, you know, my government right or wrong. But the women are saying, you know, the heck with you. I'm taking the kids and getting out of here. Um, so this, this protest movement is unique in Japan for two reasons. One is they, they normally don't protest. You know, there's a, a uh, hierarchical structure where they, they really seem to want to believe what their government says. But, uh, so that, that, that whole concept of protesting on the order of 200,000 people very, very rarely happens in Japan. And here it's happening week after week. The other piece of that is that, um, it's being spearheaded by women. You know, this is a, a patriarchal society. So to see women take the lead, on this uh, on this matter is uh, is a really significant cultural change. I'm going to be in in uh, Tokyo and in uh, um, uh, in Japan, not just Tokyo, but in uh, some of the surrounding areas for two weeks. And the organizations that are putting me uh, up in Japan are run by women. Uh, so this is a cultural change. I hope it continues, but it's a cultural change the likes of which the Japanese have never seen before. And what do you think is in store for, for the plant uh, in the coming year? Well, Fukushima Daiichi 1, 2, and 3 are unimaginably contaminated. Um, you know, I suspect they'll pick around the edges and, and, and look. But, the, you know, the fact is the cores have been breached and there's radioactive material inside the containment and outside the containment. Now, I'm not saying there's a meltdown. What I'm saying is that because the containment leaks, the water's in contact with the fuel. The fuel is tiny, tiny particles. And now nuclear fuel has been lifted out of the containment through holes and leaks in, in, in piping runs and in penetrations, electrical penetrations, and is now in other buildings. The, the concentration of radioactivity in something called the Taurus Room, which is not part of the containment, it's outside the containment, is so high it tells me that um, radioactive dust uh, has settled on the floor of this building and is now flooded under five, six, seven feet of water. Uh, but th there's no technology to clean that up. It's got to be, um, and yet to wait is 300 years. Um, I don't know, you know, perhaps uh, not in my lifetime, but somebody will come up with uh, with a robot to go in and clean it up. But another possibility is that they could just pour concrete over some of these uh, highly contaminated areas and, and wait 300 years and come back. Now, I did this for a living, and, and 
And I don't know how you would get near enough to these areas to do an adequate cleanup. Didn't the U.S. military come up with a plan to entomb the reactors almost immediately after the incident, and it was never carried out? Uh, right. Entombing the reactors after the incident is uh, would have been really hard because there's an enormous amount of decay heat left over, um, and the heat had to be you had to cool the reactors down. But you know we're a year and a half out, and and per, you know perhaps in the next two or three years there will be less heat to the point where you could entomb the reactors. Um, so I was never a fan of entombing the reactors at the beginning because that would create a meltdown because there's no place for the water to take the heat and, and the cores would have melted. So entombment early on I don't think was a good idea, but at this point my my mind is changing and I think um, perhaps on units 1, 2, 3, and 4 the best thing to do is to... Uh, uh, keep them cool for a couple more years and then entomb them for, for 300 and come back. Unit 4 is a different story. We've got to get the fuel out. Um, it's, it's up in the air. There's no containment. If there's a seismic event, it would, it would burn in air. Um, so that's uh, got to be everybody's uh, uh, focal point right now. Well, the mainstream media really hasn't been covering this story at all in the recent months, but it's been still... Uh, covered extensively by uh, alternative media, E and E News has been really big on that. And do you think the story is over? I think this is still going to be a long slog. You know, I, I think first off, you're going to see the cancer fatalities growing, and despite the best uh, attempts by the Japanese government to cover this thing up, um, citizens are going to get the information out that there's a lot of deformities and there's a lot of cancers. Um, that are, will be identified in the next couple of years. You know, the the on-site problems are um, are incredibly costly. At nothing, it's nothing else. There's uh, the amount of money to solve that problem is daunting. The Japanese aren't aren't facing up to that. You know, they they talk about well, this this quarter we need ten billion. This quarter we need ten billion, and nobody's saying that. Hey, we're going to be at this for fifty years going to be at this for half a trillion dollars. They're not that, they don't want to hear that because the number is so um, astronomically high, I think it's frightening. But uh, I've been saying this for a year now. To, if you, to solve a big problem, you have to admit you have a big problem. And um, to my mind, um, the, the Japanese, uh, because their mainstream media is not, um, is not bringing, the, bringing it up, are, um, are unaware of the magnitude of the problem. Unfortunately, California seems to have been having some small earthquake swarms. At least the silver lining here, have we learned some lessons from Fukushima that we can apply to safety in the future? I don't think we've learned any of the lessons from Fukushima. Uh, you know, the, the, the um, United States government, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, is uh, is applying several band-aid fixes, but you know, as long as we've got 23 of these nuclear reactors identical to Fukushima operating, with um, you know the old containment vents and and uh, um, the NRC seems perfectly willing to look the other way and admit that these containments are the poorest design in the world. During the middle of the accident, a guy named Chuck Casso. Um, uh, who is now the region uh, the region three administrator out of Chicago, blurted out in a phone call, these are the worst containments in the world. So the NRC knows that these Mark I containments are the worst in the world, and they're continuing to allow them to operate. To my way of thinking, unless you face that problem, you haven't learned the lessons of Fukushima. Okay, well, thanks so much, Ernie. I mean, what are you up to in the future? Can you tell us a little bit about what, what Fairwinds has got in store for us? Well, um, I, I go to uh, the, the future is bright for Fairwinds, and I go to uh, to Tokyo for two weeks. So last week in August and the first week in September, um, I'll be speaking in to, to Tokyo University, uh, Kyoto University. Um, I'll be speaking um, uh, throughout the country, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, the other, uh, the other thing that's keeping us really busy right now is the San Onofre problems, and the fact that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allowed this thing to be built and operated, and really jeopardized all of Southern California. Um, 
we've got a fundraiser underway, and if any of your uh, your listeners would like to go over to our PayPal on our site, I sure would appreciate it because in order to do this kind of stuff, Maggie and I work for free, but but it still costs money to, to produce these videos, and I'd appreciate some help. Thanks. Yeah, I really would encourage everybody to, to go pitch in a few bucks to Arnie and pitch in a few bucks to us. You want to sponsor a podcast? That'd be great because we can't do these podcasts without you. Um, thank you so much for coming on, on the podcast, Arnie, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to speaking with you again. Okay, thanks for having me. Bye-bye.